Welcome back to another episode of The Gayest Generation, where we hear LGBTQ older adults speak for themselves. Every episode, we sit down with a different member of the LGBTQ community who laid the foundation for the freedoms we have today. Now, I'm very excited about today's episode. We speak with Thomas McCauley, where we discuss his surviving conversion therapy, the magic of gay kismet, and the journey to self-love. This is the gayest generation. Hi, my name is Thomas McCauley. I'm in my 60s. Yay. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess I identify as just gay. You had mentioned that the younger generation doesn't understand the older generation. What's that misunderstanding? Um, Well, even the two generations prior to me... um, Things were very different. When I came out, Mm -hmm. um, it was the four Bs where you socialize. Bars, bookstores, bathhouses, and the bushes. Mm -hmm. Um, In a lot of of ways, it was easier because um, everyone had that one gay friend, but it wasn't talked about. It just happened. Mm -hmm. Um, Now everything's here. You know, when I was young, it was Phil Donahue running around with the microphone, driving everyone nuts. He always had on drag queens. Even yes. when I was young, I was like, what is up with the drag queens? <laughs> Who's Marla? Uh, and it's, it's, it was just different. Um, people were very reserved. Um, you weren't free like you are now. And to me, the new generation is a double-edged sword. Mm-hmm. Um, because, yeah, they're free. Yes, you can get married. Uh, me personally, from the older generation, I would rather have all my civil rights mm-hmm. and not be discriminated against and get married. Um, to me, marriage is very, it's complicated. Yes. Um, especially when you get the legalities into it. I mean, I don't want to go into divorce court. He's got my disc up ball and my glitter and, you know, <laughs> I don't want to go through all that. Um, I've been together with the guy, my husband, my real husband, for mm-hmm. 30 years. 30 years. Yeah. That's and, something to celebrate. And to you younger people, 30 years goes by in a blink. Yeah. Okay, and don't think it doesn't because it does. <sighs> I was 17 the other day with your typical teenage angst, <laughs> and now I have angst because, you know, when I was young, I was always in a hurry. Mm-hmm. I wanted everything right. I wanted it now. I wanted it right now. Oof. And I always drove like an idiot. Urgh, come on, move, get out of the way, you old man, do the speed limit. And I'd be flipping people off. Now I'm the one getting flipped off because it's like, why are you in such a hurry? Leave 15 minutes earlier. Jesus, yeah. relax. It all it all changes. And I, if I have any recommendation to the young generation, it's read your history books. Ooh. Do some in, Do some investigation. You have no idea what we went through. Mm. The freedoms that you have right now are on the back and sweat and lives of people that were beat to death, Mm -hmm. um, discriminated against in ways that you can't imagine that you think, oh, is this an HBO movie? No, it's not. It was real life. Sure. Um, I experienced a lot of it, but not as bad as other people did. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a thing in the psychiatric world called the DSM-4-5. It's all the list of all the afflictions. And when I was young... Um, I had mentioned to you that I told my mother, oh, you know, I'm gay. Mm-hmm. Um, last year was model railroading and miniature golf. And for a <laughs> while, she was okay with it. And um, then she wasn't. And then they put me in a hospital for a year. And the year that I went in there was, I believe, shortly after they had um, decided that homosexuality and lesbianism was not a mental illness, but it was, in fact, genetic. But tell the old guard that. Yeah. And um, that year of my life changed me. Here it is 45 years later, and it's still affecting me. And you said your mother was okay with it, and then something switched into a point. What Um, was the point? mm, Well, that's a good question. Uh, My parents, I'm adopted Mm -hmm. into Irish Catholics. Both my parents are what were considered functional alcoholics. Sure. And very Catholic. Oh, sometimes Very that goes hand in hand. Catholic. Okay. And I'm not saying anything against religion. I'm just saying that we're very Catholic. Um, I think I'm if you grew up sure as a Catholic, you can say bad things about Catholics because well, we, were, we were Catholics. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. It, it was, that's a whole other episode, but that, sure. was, that was 
interesting. I'll just put it that way. I don't know what happened. Um, I think the newness of it, you know, for, oh, really? And, well, let's talk about it. And, you know, we get... We, I remember this one day we're in this store called Venture, and she's like, who do you think is cute? So I'm pointing all the guys I think are cute, and then it wasn't all that long after that. I think t- for her, looking back and with the conversations we had decades later, I think something switched in the reality of, oh, my son is that. Sure. Um, hit home. Yes. And then, you know, the way she was raised, mm-hmm. okay, because you weren't gay, you were queer. Or a faggot, mm-hmm. and um, and it was really looked down upon. It's the last thing you want your son to be, um, or your child, your daughter, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's what happened, and then I think my father got involved with it. Um, he was a fireman. Um, you know what I mean? I see, macho, yeah, macho. Exactly, all the machismo BS, and one thing led to another, and then I'm locked up. Mm-hmm. And I spent 11 and a half months in there. Wow. In hospital hell. Yep. And um, there was 18 of us on the unit. Um, we were in two different teams. The green team was the the drug addicts mm-hmm. and the alcoholics. And the yellow team were the suicide, depressed group. Um, so the alphas and the betas, basically. And I was in the yellow team. Mm-hmm. And um, the counselors there, most of them were in college, so, you know, how much did they know? And those were the ones wow. I, I told you. Yeah, exactly. And they're playing with my life. They're learning how to be doctors. And they have no clue. By being, air quotes, doctors to you. Exactly. Um, this one woman, her name was Karen, ironically. <laughs> um, I was there like a week or so, and um, she had me sit on the floor. We're in a room not much bigger than this. And there was nine of us in there. And she had um, this girl sit down next to me. And she goes, okay, hug her and hold her. Mm-hmm. And then she asked me, what did that feel like? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. And then she had this really cute boy sit down next to me. And um, he was Latino, and I have a thing for Latinos. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> um, and she goes, well, hug him. And I did. And she goes, how does that feel? And I go, it felt great. Yeah. Because it did. Why I'm not going to lie. You asked me a question. I'm going to tell you the truth. And she started pointing at me and calling me a queer and a faggot and a sissy and got all the kids to do the same thing. And from that point forth, that's all it was. And I think something that I never knew, and I think a lot of people do not know, is what the mechanics of conversion therapy actually is. People say conversion therapy. We right. don't really understand what that entails. Basically, what they do is they take everything they learn... They play games with you, okay? They figure everything out about you, okay? I like pork sausage, and I like daffodils, whatever it is. And they figure out what it it is that make you tick, and then they sit there and beat your brain and tell you everything about you is wrong. Yes. Um, That's hard to take. Now, you got to – I was 14, 15 when all this was going on. That's young. Yes. Um, if you've ever met anybody that's for anywhere between like 12 and 16, mm-hmm. what's their mental capacity? Yeah. What's their reasoning abilities? Sure. Um, n- almost non-existent. Yeah. Okay. At that age, you know, uh, your testes drop and all of a sudden you're horny all the time. You don't know why and you're exploring <laughs> the world and what's a Democrat? What's a Republican? What's this? What's that? You don't know what's going on. And then to have a group of people, adults, who were raised to believe are all knowing and all powerful, mm. sit there and tell you how horrible you are. Mm-hmm. And every time you come out of your room, hey, fag, you know, that type of thing. And to get the other kids involved in it yes. was, it was a nightmare, an absolute nightmare. Uh, I didn't think it would ever, the only, in fact, the only reason it ended was my father's insurance ran out. That's a twist of fate. Yep. It worked out well, though, I guess, because um, they had taken me out a month or two before his insurance ended, they had this, they went out, to, we went out to my high school and they had this thing called placement, which is, um, what they wanted to do was send me to a place in Maine, um, so I could get further treatment so I could change and be better. And the school pay, district pays for it. The public school district. That's correct. And I remember on the ride out there, my doctor's like, no, 
you know, you got to let them know that you got problems. And, you know, he was coaching me on what to say and what not to say mm -hmm. so that w they would get the money they wanted. And, well, of course, I did what they wanted because I thought I was supposed to. And they got the money and they were going to send me to Maine. Well, before they could get me there, my dad's insurance ran out. So I believe in kismet. Yeah. Um, I believe in the fates. Sure. You live long enough, you see things. Oof. And um, it was a weekend when they let me out. Mm -hmm. And uh, my parents lived out in the suburbs of Chicago. And like I told you, bars, bushes, bathhouses, and bookstores. Indeed. There happened to be a forest preserve um, a few miles from my mom's house. And we were going to leave in a couple of days. And I told my mom, I'm like, can I go see my friends before I leave? Mm -hmm. Well, I went out to this forest preserve where I knew there was gay guys. And I used the only thing I had to offer, which was my body. Sure. And I found an older guy, and I met him. And I explained the situation, and I go, could you save me? Mm -hmm. And he did. And he, ended, through a friend of his, he sent me to Florida until I turned 18. Wow. Not to backtrack a little bit sure. so we don't keep on moving. It's fine. Something that's striking to me is that the kids you were on the ward with were not all conversion therapy patients. No, I was it. And what was your relationship like with the other kids on the ward? Oh, that was interesting, too. Yeah. Um, well, I don't mean to sound arrogant or grandiose. That was one of their favorite words. You're grandiose. Um <laughs> As if that's such but a bad I thing. But I figured out how the game that they played. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things they like to do is they call it video therapy, and they'd sit you in a room, and they would talk to you and needle you. And then, uh, and the, uh, ironically enough, the guy who ran the video thing was gay. And <laughs> I know. And so were the three teachers in the school. So we all knew. Uh. And um, so I basically I went in there, and I acted as – flamboyant as possible and then when the video was over i sat there and watched it and oh boo hoo hoo i'm such a fag and i got an a <laughs> but um there was a movie with sally phil called norma ray and i became the norma ray of one west <laughs> and i remember this one girl jenny she was such a sweetheart and she was terrified because she had to do video therapy one day i don't know what to do i don't know what to do and i'm like you want to want to know the secret and she's like yeah i could just go in there and be a total Cuckoo bird? Yeah, no. How, how can I say this? I'm in a library. A female dog. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, you can say bitch. Oh, okay. I told her to be a total bitch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and she was. <laughs> and she's just obnoxious, and she played the part really well. And I go, and then when they show your video, just, oh, I can't believe I'm like that. And she did, and it worked out great. And she came up later, and she goes, thank you for saving me. Wow. And what you learned to do was not change who you are. I you, you learned how myself. to act the way other people myself. want you to. Yeah. I played the game. Yep. Um, because it hurt. Mm. It hurt a lot. <laughs> yeah. And 45 years later, it's still, I can still smell the cleaning products. Um, <laughs> remember when they were, uh, the movie Titanic, when she was talking about, I can still smell the paint? Yes. Same thing. I can still hear the voices. I can still feel the carpet, the uncomfortable beds, because there were metal frames like in a prison. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things you remember. See, I believe in life that we don't get over anything. We just learn to live with it. Oh, ooh, I okay, agree. You don't get over death. You don't get over divorce. You don't get over anything. You just get adjusted to it. It becomes part of you. That's what happened to me. They totally trashed who I was as a person. Um made me feel horrible. I left there. I went in there not liking life to begin with. Mm -hmm. And yeah. by the time I left there, um, I was on a suicide mission, but I was too chicken to do it. So I found other ways. I call it the slow death. Mm. Um, alcohol, drugs, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, because I was too afraid to do it. But I, did, I didn't want to die, but I didn't know how to live. Mm. Oof. And so that makes it, um, made it really, really difficult for me. I had no identity. Um, after I got out of there, um, one of the, I met this guy in high school, just head over heels. You know, we all had the first crush. Um, but I couldn't grow a beard, so he wasn't interested. <laughs> I know. Anyway, Why were you so picky? For what? I don't know. Anyway. He had daddy issues. <laughs> you know, looking back, 
Yeah, get in you line, know, sister. Yeah, um, he, was a few, he was a few fries short of a Happy Meal, as it turns <laughs> out. But you know, what are you going to do? We love who we love, and yeah. that's what I thought it was. I didn't realize, you know, years later, you look, oh, it's infatuation, run along. Um, but when I was in the hospital, he's all I thought about. Because um, it, um, it gave me hope. Yes. And um, because they take that from you. They take everything, your self-esteem, your pride, your joy, your happiness, um, and they destroy it. And I, I told you before, I used to sit and stare out uh, the windows and look at the planes <laughs> and wonder where the hell they were going, and I wanted to be on them desperately. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost embarrassed, but you know. Don't be. I'm real. Uh, that was such a horrible time. It, and that's why I said it, it never goes away. Yeah. Ever, ever, ever. Um, that's why, you know, if I, if I have a message to young people, um, don't let people destroy you. Yes. Just don't. If you don't like something, that's fine. If you do like something, that's fine. Um, figure out, find your own pathway in life. Figure out what it is that you believe in and just run with it. I got off the train yeah, I when you said you were in Maine. Mm-hmm. No, you were about no, to go to Maine. they were going to send me to the Maine. And I ran Met off. the older gentleman. I got away, yeah. And when, is that when you went to San Francisco, or is that when you went? He to- sent me to Florida. Then I found, I got a hold of the, the kid that I fell in love with in I high see. school. I got a hold of his mother, and she goes, he went to California. He's in a cult. I'm <laughs> like, oh, uh, give me the phone number anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and so I get a hold of him, and he goes, I'm in San Francisco. You're not going to believe it. There's so many gay people, you know, because when we were young, we thought, oh, was there like a hundred of them? Yeah. And I got out to California the weekend of gay pride and had a panic attack. I, I thought every gay person on earth was not say, I didn't know there was that many. All kinds. Overstimulated. Way overstimulated. Yeah. I panicked. Yeah. I'm like, get me out of here. Ooh. I did not like it at all. Um, but yeah, see... When I was in the hospital hell, I met one of the kids that had gone to that hospital in Maine. And he told me two things that scared the hell out of me. He goes, one, if they prescribe you even an aspirin, they can keep you as long as they want. Mm. And two, if you have a conflict with any of the kids, they put you in a box, they ring and you at the box. Well, I'm not what? violent. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, no. No, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm not into that. No. Um, I remember having a panic attack because I had to go sign up for the draft. And my father dragged me down. You got to do it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't want to go. Too bad. So I wrote on say it's a subject or whatever it was, or checked the box, whatever yeah. it was. Um, so I didn't have to go to Maine. I got away from that. The old guy saved me. Peter the Greek. Very Greek. Shout out to Peter. Yeah, for what he it's was worth. a sweetheart. Yeah. For what it's worth. He was. Um <laughs> I knew him until he passed away a few years. He died the same year as my mom, 2014. Uh, so it, it was cool. He um, he drove me nuts because he was so hard on me um, because, of course, that's how his parents were on him. Um, you need to get a job. You need to do this. You need to do that. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't want to. I want to play. Yeah. You know, I was like, I was a kid. You're, I was going to say, you are still a kid. Yes, very much so. Yep. Um so he sent me to Florida with, uh, to go live with Joe. Um, I met Joe in Indianapolis. It was Peter's friend. Joe was gorgeous, gorgeous, <laughs> gorgeous, gorgeous. He was so handsome it was distracting. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, of course, I wanted to go to Florida because he had another friend named Larry who lived in Tennessee. And we're at this house, and I met them both, and, and Larry just looked at me like I was in an appetizer. Uh, okay. And he gave me the creeps. Yeah, and I'm yeah, like, yeah. I want to go to Florida. And Peter's like, I figured you'd want to go live with Joe. And I'm like, well, you know, given the option, sure. why go to Tennessee when I can go to Florida? <laughs> anyway, so I did, and I stayed down there in 
until just about I turned 18. Then I went. I found my friend and went to California. And you're you're fresh off the ward at this point. Yep. What's going on in your head during this time? Because it's I could only I can only imagine Scared there's a freedom. Death. Um, if I saw a squad car, I'd panic. Yeah. Because I knew my parents would be looking for me. Oh. And um, that was the longest summer of my life because mm-hmm. I turned 18 in August. And that's all I could think about. Yes. And then, of course, you go places and I had to lie about my age. And I could, I could <laughs> you're born here, just add two years. And I couldn't figure it out. I was always scared to death. And I didn't want to say anything to anybody. Um but I ended up working at the cute guy Joe got me a job at the gay bar in Daytona Beach called the Landmark, um, which was really interesting. I was a dishwasher in the restaurant, um, so nowhere where there's alcohol, mm-hmm. and there was lots of drag queens and um, these things called leather guys. I'd never seen them before, <laughs> just black chiffon. Yeah. <laughs> like whatever. Yeah. It, <laughs> what this is the this is the eighties. This yes, is the okay. early 80s. Early 80s. Like 80. Yeah. And um, there's the <laughs> cowboy and western section, and there's the leather people, and then there's the disco dollars, and there's the drag queens. The village people. Basically. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. And, I, and I'm involved in this. And yeah. I'm like, oh, and I, I was over in the restaurant with this cook. I can't remember his name, but he, he was such a ditz. <laughs> he couldn't do an over easy egg to save his life. Mm. And just piss off all the alcoholics. <laughs> um, but the waiter, this guy named Buddy or Bobby, something with a B and a Y, I don't know what it was. Bitchy. Yeah. <laughs> um, he had a total attitude. He, he really did. He, he just thought he was God's gift to the waiting world. I know a couple of those. Yeah, I know. Whatever. <laughs> Base your life on your job. That's what happens. Sure. Um, but I stayed there for until I got a hold of my... I was there for... I don't know, like seven or eight, not that long, but long enough. Long enough to get the worst sunburn of my life. I do not recommend it. No. Uh, I didn't feel my ass for three weeks. <laughs> Jeez, I didn't think I'd ever get off that bus. Probably and the only thing I, I remember, I, I, he goes, it, I think it was like $2 for this thing called BART. It's um, their subway. Yes. And um, so I had to save that. And I'm on a Greyhound bus going from Florida. From coast to coast, and I had a loaf of bread, white bread to eat. That was my food all the way across. And I'm like, this is fun. Knowing you have to save that $2 to get on the yes. train once you're there. And I remember we had a layover in somewhere in Texas. Population, nothing. Population, nothing. Mm-hmm. And hot. And um, we got off into the station, and I smelled Burger King. And there was a lady on the bus who had been talking to me, and I was just like, I remember going over and just standing there, and she bought me Burger King, and I hate the Whopper because it has all that vegetable slop on it. <laughs> and I just tore it up. Yeah. I was so gra- grateful. I didn't know what gratitude was until my 50s. <sighs> but at that time, it was the best burger I'd ever had. And you're going to San Francisco to meet this person from your high school. That I'm in love with, yes. You make this cross-country journey, mm-hmm. and it's not the, like, I can barely go meet my friend at their house without texting them, hey, I'll be there in five mm-hmm. minutes. I can only imagine what it's like to travel across the country and you show up at the San Francisco Greyhound station and you look around and what do you do? You go out of the station and turn left and go to Market Street and get yeah. on the train. <laughs> and then you find a pay phone and you call your friend Collect so he knows you're there. Sure. See, that, that's already too much for me. Yeah. <laughs> but well, anyways. We were survivors. We did what we had to do. But that's how I knew I arrived. <laughs> mm-hmm. I called Collect and then he hung up and he figured out how long it would take me to get there. And When I got out to Concord, California, um, I had to wait like 20 minutes before he showed up. And is that Northern California, or is yes. that just right outside? It's um, north east of the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. And what's your plan? I didn't have one. Yeah. I just wanted to turn 18. That was it. Mm-hmm. Because until then, I paranoid, I, I don't even know how to describe I was afraid of everything. Yeah. Um, because had I got caught by the cops, that I wouldn't have had a choice. Because they would have called my parents, and I would have went right to Maine. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it was walking on eggshells. And did that paranoia follow you into your adulthood as well? Of course. 
how did that affect your time in San Francisco? And as you're moving in with this person who you have big mm-hmm. love feelings for. Only to find out that he, the guy that he's living with is his lover. Ooh, and yeah. Like, I had no idea. And I'm like, oh, wonderful. Big letdown. <sighs> Huge. Is like, I don't know how to describe it because puppy love, you know, your first love, it's way intense. Um, you know, I, I was a romantic even as a youngster. You know, I pictured us being together forever. And and then the, the reality of it is like taking a two by four and smacking you in the forehead. Yes. And it was like, oh, more rejection. Let's see, my parents rejected me. My birth parents rejected me. Um, it's just a lifetime... A, a lifetime of disloyalty, dishonesty, rejection. Society rejects insecurity. me. Insecurity. Well, of course. Yep. You know, uh, for me, it was my birth parents didn't want me. Then my adoptive parents thought I was a freak. So they put me in a hospital. Then I went there and they confirmed it. Um, and then society back then, it was like, you got to go way back. There's Anita Bryant. Um, uh, that one. And for folks who wouldn't know, Anita Bryant would be a orange juice sales yes, lady. Jesus. I don't know. Have you ever heard of Waylon Flowers and Madam? Yes. He had a joke about um, Anita Bryant. He goes, you know how to tell the difference between a Florida orange and a California orange? Which do you get a ho- orange from each state or a hole in both of them suck on them? <laughs> and the one that sucks back is from Florida. <laughs> and that was a dig at... Um, <laughs> <laughs> there was a dig at Anita Bryant. Yeah. Who's, uh, she's much like people we see on TV uh, today. Yeah. Her whole job was just to hate gay people well, on a microphone. Well, the thing of it was, if I'm remembering my history correctly, sure. if not, leave it in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> um, her husband f- didn't come out of the closet. He flew. Oh, oh, so it was personal. Yeah. Exactly. I just keep thinking about that video of her getting pied in the face. Wasn't that great? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, like, uh, yeah. it's like a warm hug. It is. Um, what were we talking about before? California, arriving in San Francisco. Yep. Um, and he's, he's living with his boyfriend, or we want to call yes. it. Yes. Oh, that word lover. Yes. Are you my lover? I hate it. God, it's just, it, it I does. don't like it either. It's and I like tell nails you why. across a chalkboard. Oh, it's so cheap. Yeah. Oof. You know. It's like another way of saying you're the guy that's doing me now. Sure. And there's a difference between lover and boyfriend. Yeah, very much Lovers so. come and go. Yeah. Lovers are like a... They're like a rental movie. You have it for three <laughs> days. Don't forget to rewind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I renew this? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, what are you... There's so much going on when you arrive. What are you thinking about? Like, this is how I'm going to make money. This is how I'm going to... No, I'm going to move I out. I didn't. I'm gonna... I had worked for Peter um, cleaning apartments before he sent me to Florida. So, And I he owed me $175. Ooh. And he was pissed that I went to California. And he went, and I kept calling him and he wouldn't send it. It took him like two months to send it to me. Mm-hmm. And um, no, I didn't think about that. You know, th- that's why when I talk to you, um, as an older gay man, I think it's our responsibility to help the younger ones. Mm-hmm. Um, because when I was coming up, the only thing the older gay guys wanted you for was your body. I was just going to say. That's it. Then, you know, they could go tell their friends, I had that one and that one and that one and that one. That type of crap. Mm-hmm. I call it the gay rut. Drinks, drugs, and... Fallacy. Intercourse. Yes. I'm trying to be polite. <laughs> um, Intercourse is a nasty I I word than sex. Yes, I know. I don't normally edit myself, but... Appreciate you. It's my pleasure. Um, <laughs> but that's what it was. And... Somebody needs, I think the older generation needs to tell the younger tr- generation, look, um, you need, life goes by a lot quicker than you think it does. You know, you might wait forever to turn 21, but then you're going to be 25, then 30. Then one day you're going to wake up somewhere in your 40s and you're going to go, oh. Mm-hmm. So, see, I'm in my 60s now. And me and my husband were like, we've come to the reality of what's going to happen when one of us dies. What's the other one going to do? His family can't stand us. Mm-hmm. Um, here we are in the year 2024, and when his family gets mad at us, we're the faggots. <sighs> and other choice words. Yes. And uh, I don't know why it shocks Still. me, because you are very much grown adults. Right. And it's it's uh, mind-boggling. His 80-year-old mother. 
Yeah. Tells me that I like to suck lollipops. Do you understand? <laughs> and in her 80 years of life, mm -hmm. she never came across a life lesson where it's like, maybe you shouldn't. No. Yeah. It's I, unbelievable. I tell, but see, she's Polish. <laughs> so one day I decided to let her know what I thought of that. And oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. You would have thought that I knocked the building down, ripped out her fingernails with the pliers. <laughs> <laughs> and how would you say that to me? Oh, it hurts my feelings. I go, well, now you know. Yes. Well, it's not the same thing. You had a choice. Potato, potato. I go, what do you mean I had a choice? Yeah. It's not like I was eating a hot dog one day. Oh, here's an idea. Yeah. This reminds me of something. Yeah. <laughs> Just relax. Um, how does your husband react to that coming from his own parents? Oh, At this day and age. He's such a sweetie pie. Yeah. Okay. We're Oscar and Felix. But I'm not a slob. But he's Felix. <laughs> okay, we're definitely polar opposites, but we're not. Yeah. I don't know how to explain it. It works. Um, it hurts him so much that he just ignores it. That's the only way I can. That's his coping mechanism. I get enraged. Um, I try not to because I, you know, I'm studying Buddhism and all this spirituality stuff, and I try to be forgiving and la 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 la. Um, but there's some days. Where I want to be like the monkey at the zoo and just take a pile of poop and throw it at him. Yes. Because it's so insulting. And the only time they're nice to us is when they want money. Oh. Over the last seven years, we've given them $35,000, the mother and brother. Well, that's the mother and the brother. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the dynamic right there. I know. God damn it. We're basically indentured servants. And so do, so do you live near them? We live with them. Oh, well, there you go. We came up from Indiana because the mother's like, I'm getting old. I need someone to help me. My finger hurts. <laughs> She's one of those, okay? How can I explain? She's never happy. <laughs> um, she just isn't. <laughs> I like sunny days with clothes. Look, there's, it's sunny and there's top. They're not the right clothes. I like the big fluffy ones that look like cotton balls. Oh, the day is destroyed. Oh, my gosh. Oh, the temperature's horrible. <laughs> oh, my show's not on TV. <laughs> and that's what she sounds like. It's like, God. I'm it's funny because I'm distant. Ugh, but I I'm, just want to say, it's like, you know, you, you don't work. Yeah. You get buttholes full of cash every month from the government and yeah. from your reverse mortgage and everything else. What are you worried about? Yeah. And you're in the final chapter? Yeah. Be nice. You would think. <laughs> yeah. And she was, she, she was, at one time she's into Sylvia Brown, the psychic, right? Oh, yes. And I'm like, so, I'm like, so do you believe in God? Oh, I don't know anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, you better make up your mind because you're pretty close to meeting it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He'll want to know yeah. when you show up. be a fly on the wall when she shows up. <laughs> I can just hear God, so Gidget, what you think? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe when she shows him at the pearly gates, yeah. Sylvia you know, Brown's there. There's something up with St. Peter. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Well, I love the show Frasier, mm. and Niles was talking one day about some narcissistic opera singer. It's all about me, 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 me. <laughs> 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 I okay. I love Frasier, the show, but I don't like Frasier. I like Niles. Oh, because Niles is a who? Yes. Frasier is like an itch. It's like just go away. Jesus, how much <laughs> lotion do you need? Whereas well, and then Niles, Niles is, an is idiot. gay in real life. Yes, and he's gay in the show too. I don't yeah, know what they're I trying know, to say. Please. And then and then Frasier's dad is gay. Yeah. I'm like, there's a. We're everywhere. Yeah. I worked in Hollywood, honey. Trust me, they're everywhere. <laughs> okay, I cannot wait to get to that story. Yeah, so you're in too. San Francisco. It's the mm -hmm. early 80s. Yes, it's like 1980. I remember uh, when we met over the phone, you had talked about how you were a phlebotomist mm -hmm. during that time. Yeah, I, that was fun. To put it into context, you draw people's blood in mm -hmm. San Francisco during... In the Bay or Northern California, up in Sacramento, really. Okay, so more towards that mm -hmm. area, as the AIDS epidemic is starting, in mm -hmm. those first few years, people didn't know what the hell was going on. Oh, yeah. There is a movie with Woody Allen called Sleeper. Mm -hmm. And in one of the scenes, they have him in this outfit. It's like a beekeeper's outfit. You have the thing over your head and your hands. When we would go into the AIDS patient's room, and I'm using quotes as I'm saying that, people, um, we had things across our shoes, nothing that we wore, 
could be visible, mm -hmm. including our face. They didn't even take the bedpans out of the room. They just left you there, and um, it was like the plague. It, it was horrible, which really helped my self-image yeah. um, because it was like I didn't like – after going through what I went through in the hospital, mm -hmm. um, then realizing, oh, having no identity, then seeing all these things, I didn't fit well into the gay life. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in California, L.A. was, everyone, I'm going to be a star. I've got okay. an agent. It's like, yeah, whatever. You work at 7-Eleven. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> and then the people up north, they call them the Castro clones. Um, Boots, construction boots. Yeah. Do you know the difference between standard and the regular screwdriver? No. Sure don't. Exactly. And but 501s, I'm wearing, had to Carhartt. beards, <laughs> yeah. more beards, and crew cuts. That was the Castro clone. I can see it. And hankies. For whatever you're into, it was ridiculous. It's like, uh. The hanky code fascinates me because in the age of grinder and stuff, we just say it. But back in the day, you used to let people know what you were into by wearing a certain color yes. hanky in a certain place. Oh, God. One side's the top. Yeah. The other side isn't. Um, th that type of thing. And then, you know, it's like the giver, the receiver, the catcher, the batter. It's like, oh, Baloney. God, Jesus. I just couldn't get into any of it. Sure. Okay. Because yep. it was like, I didn't see it like that. I just wanted to meet a guy, go to the beach, go to a movie, go to dinner. Go to bed. Sure. Um, maybe not in that order either. <laughs> um, who wants a full belly? <laughs> but but you know it's it's like I wasn't into that. It yep. made it made my skin crawl. Skin crawl. Um, and I think in the end, it's what saved me because I, I wasn't into because the first guy I fell in love with. You don't have a beard, go away. So I just immediately resented everyone with the beard. Uh, no offense. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like. Um, so I, I just didn't get into that scene, and it was so out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can remember going to it. Remember that show, Too Close for Comfort, with Ted Knight? Mm -mm. Okay. But tell well, me. Anyway, there was a park, and the house was over there. They actually had to paint the house another color because people kept coming to see it. Well, across the street from that house is this big park. Well, the guy I was with at the time, we decided to go visit this park. Now, it's broad daylight. I see. On a weekend. A certain type of park where certain things occur? No, a regular park. A regular old park. And we come walking across the path, and there's two guys going at it. And it's like, <laughs> I said, oh, okay, don't let me get in your way. But there's, like, people all over the place. I don't know how to explain it. There is some unverbalized or unspoken, um, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but I, uh, and I think this might be uh, – Similar to other people's experience, I thought to myself, that's what I'm supposed to be. Yes. Wh whoever it is that I am, th that's that not it. I'm it. supposed to be that. The guy, when my friend took me to meet his friend, remember I told you yep. that, we hit it off. Well, he was one that was like, oh, no. Lover is just someone that you're living with for the moment, and then you got to go out and get this one, that one, this one, that one. Sure. Well, I tried that life. Yeah. And one night stands, and... It just didn't work out. I gave it that old schoolboy try. Absolutely. Um, but no, it didn't work. And shout out to... To those that sluts. could handle it. We I, love I'm not you. criticizing anything. Yeah. You know, to each his own. Absolutely. Um, if it works for you, that is amazing. There's 64 colors in the cram box. Pick one. They even got 128 cram uh, box now. C, exactly. LGBTQIA+. Letters, plus. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but it, it all goes together, doesn't it? <laughs> the next guy I met. Um, <laughs> sometimes, you know, the clue phone rings, and you just don't pick it up. Ring a ding ding. Pick it up. It's for you. Yeah. Um, the last guy I was with in California, when I met him, his mother was on husband number eight. It's kind of See what I mean? The phone's ringing. <laughs> pick it up. <laughs> you know, because apples don't fall far from the tree. Uh um, so, yeah, that was eight years of bless his heart. Now that I'm older and I've got 40 years separation from us, I understand. Mm -hmm. um, but going through it was different. Um, because I was with him when the whole AIDS thing started. Mm -hmm. um, he was very out. I was not. Okay. When the AIDS thing came about, I withdrew even more. 
and um, insecure in ways that, to this day, are almost difficult to verbalize. Yeah. Um, because coming from that hospital, I was manic. I wasn't bipolar. I was depressed, mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, and things just kept compounding. And I couldn't find the right relationship. I couldn't find the right situation. I couldn't find the right friends. Um, but I found this stuff called cocaine. And since I was a sloth-like personality to begin with, um, I remember this one weekend there was a group of us, the one with the, you know, <laughs> and this little th- line about an inch long and teeny tiny thin. And you sniff it and, oh, you're up dancing all night long. And within a month you're doing rails. And, and what you're saying was you were not that type of person. No. Where you would be out dancing or, or no, be out late at night. <laughs> Everyone wanted to go dancing. I wanted to do crossword puzzles. Yes. But <laughs> have a line or two. Yeah. And you're that thing that they wanted you to be. Yep. I understand. That. Yeah. As you're in San Francisco and as you start doing cocaine... Uh, drinking maybe no i never liked booze because it made me pee and puke yeah i had better things to do with my time what is your journey with addiction like or what has it Um, been like well let's see i don't a lot of people may scoff when i say this but i don't consider myself an addict i Mm -hmm. consider myself a hedonist um and there's a big difference for me as i told you i was on a slow suicide mission um i didn't realize this as i was going through it but as you become older and you get a Decades. Um, <laughs> Don't do that. I do that. Yeah. <laughs> decades behind your life. Uh huh. You start to realize more about yourself, and there's it's a gift when you get to know yourself mm-hmm. because all the things you think that mm-hmm. were so horrible, you realize, oh, I wasn't that bad. I wasn't that a hole yeah. that I thought I was. And when I was in my twenties, I was so depressed and I felt so bad all the time, and I didn't know where to fit in. Everyone else had families. I hated holidays. I hated meeting families. I didn't want to be around your family. I was envious of those that had them um, because of the way I grew up. Um, I never felt I had the right relationship, the right job, the right anything. And you have to remember, in California back then, materialism, everyone wanted to be Joan Collins. It's Dynasty. Where is the Bentley, the 30-inch ways, the large fellas, all all those kind of things, you know, these standards that we all set up that are so ridiculous looking back. It's like, no one can live up to that. Even if you had all those things, you still couldn't live up to it, you, you know. And you'd still be unhappy. Yeah. And um, what what went from being, a, oh, a blessing, which was, oh, suddenly I have energy, I can go do things, mm-hmm. um, became a crutch and became a burden and then we discovered this stuff called crank, which was methamphetamine, because um, it was economical. It was so much cheaper. You know, an eight ball was $300, but you could get an eight ball of crank for 100 and it would last 10 times as long. Price effective. I know. And um, so for me, I can remember, I remember this one. Here, here's the type of person I was. I was so miserable. Um, I remember this one day, I dumped out like $60 worth of crank on a mirror, which is a lot. And I snorted it all in one puff. And when I woke up on the floor, I was pissed off because I was still alive. I was hurt. Mm-hmm. I couldn't figure, I didn't understand the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. One calms you down, one speeds you up. Um, had I been a heroin addict, I'd be dead. I know for sure. Uh, because when you take your body down that road, there's no coming back. When you do too much of a stimulant, your body shuts you off. And that's what kept happening to me, and it kept pissing me off. And, oh, well, I'll just do more. I will work this time. And I wake up on the floor, in the bathroom, in the living room, in the car. And no matter what I did, I just couldn't die. And eventually, towards the end of my journey in California, I remember one day looking myself in the mirror I've always said that, for me, I always knew I was doing okay when I could brush my teeth and look in my eyes. Mm-hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. You could look into yourself. Yes, and not look down. And I asked myself, what the hell did I ever do that I found it okay to do this to myself? Mm-hmm. That was the that was a two-by-four in the head. <sighs> and 
that's when I'm like, Thomas, get off your ass. You're worth more than this. Stop it. And I got in my car and I left California. Um, prior to that, I had, I did go into sobriety. I went into a 12-step program. I would recommend it for anyone that has issues. Mm-hmm. Um, I've met true alcoholics and I've met true addicts. And then I've met those that, like me, went off the rails for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a perfect basis because you have to admit you have a problem. You have to admit that you're not Jesus Christ incarnate. And um, you have to admit that um, you were wrong. Mm-hmm. And you have to make up, try to make up for the things that you did that hurt people. Those, the steps. Basically what I got out of the 12-step program is don't be a pig. Yeah. Be responsible for your life. Um, which is a lot easier said than done for a lot of us. It was for me because it's like when you wake up, um, I woke up for two years. And the wake up was all of a sudden everything from my past and California all came and threw itself in my face. And I did my best to handle it. I went to work every day. I had the apartment. I had the car. I had this. And I was still miserable. And I'm like, what's the point of being sober if I'm still miserable? So then I went back to it, just ridiculous amounts. And it didn't work again. And that's when that, I woke up on the floor one, one too many times, and I'm like, what am I doing? I sold everything I owned. I have a cockatoo named Baby. Me and her got in the car, and we left California. And as I told you before, I had a toy to sell, so the birdcage was as big as the car. <laughs> <laughs> and I left at like two in the morning, and I remember I got to the California Nevada border, and um, I've never been shy. And I got out and I stood on Nevada, whipped it out, and pissed on California. <laughs> yeah. Truckers went by blowing their horns, <laughs> and that's exactly what I thought of the whole experience. Came back here. Where is here? Um, Illinois, Chicago. That's yep. where I grew up. And um, basically, I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but I came home to deal with my life. Uh, because I had called one of Dion Warlock's psychic friends. <laughs> oh, remember uh, that? Yes. I called her Dion Warlock. No, no offense. <laughs> I love Dion. Dion, if you're listening to this. And yes, I do him. know the way to San Jose, okay? <laughs> 580, 680. <laughs> I can get you there, okay? <laughs> Um, where was I? Oh, I um, do that a lot. It's like my brain's that's just gets. Me too. Oh, I hate and that. And I go everywhere. You're back in Chicago. Ah, uh, yes. And I still don't remember. God, I can't stand it. No, uh, and this is why I'm here. We're Thank back in you. Chicago. One of your first jobs being there mm-hmm. is being a production assistant for a television show. Yeah. Oh, that was interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I come back here. I'm here for about two weeks. And I'm very upset because it's culture shock. And the reality of everything was a bit much. So I remember walking out into the living room, and I looked at or the kitchen, and I looked at my mother and my grandmother, and I go, I don't know how much cash the two of you have in your purse, but I want it all now. So and you're like, why? And I go, because I need a drink. You came back to Chicago, and you're, is this the first time you've seen your mom in years? Yep. Wow. Yeah. What's that like? Um... Indifferent. Okay. Um, familiarity. Um, anger. Mm-hmm. Lots of pent-up anger. Lots of questions. Um, as I was adopted, I had asked her on numerous occasions where I came from. Mm-hmm. All I know about you is your name was Ronnie. All right, well, fast forward until about 2012. I'm cleaning out the garage one day, and I found a tackle box with all my papers. Holy shit. So she knew who I was and where I was from and who my family was and all that. Whoa, okay. So yeah. when you, you open up the tackle box and you learn that information, how does that impact your life and how you see yourself? It's just more disloyalty. Sure. Did you feel like you knew yourself more because you had this information now? Um, a little bit. Yeah? Yeah. I found out my name is Ronnie Lee. Ronnie Lee? Yeah, I know. Brenda Ronnie, Lee. Ronnie Lee Clayton. 
And oh, you could have been a boxer. Yeah. <laughs> my husband, he always teases me. He goes, oh, the stylings of Ronnie Lee Clayton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always thought it'd be a good nom de plume. Yes. Ronnie He's Ariel something. Clayton, that type of thing. <laughs> All I know is my kinfolk be from Tennessee. Okay. Um, which is ironic. Yeah. You were like, I'm going to Florida. I'm not going to Tennessee. Yeah, I, don't want... I know. So it's like, whatever. I've thought about looking them, you know, you go through as an adopted person, you know, who am I, where am I? It, it's mm-hmm. another, a whole other series. Um, uh, but at this point, why bother? Sure. And uh, this, I could be talking out of my ass right now and, uh, and leave it in the comments. Yeah. But as gay people, we get to make up so much of ourselves. That's the other message I have for the young ones. Um, if you're not happy with the family that you grew up in, Realize, even RuPaul has said, we create our own family as adults. Yes. That's what's important. Um, My whole thing with family got warped because of the way I grew up. Mm -hmm. Um, To me, family, whether it's someone that gave birth to you or is a friend, um, family is loyalty, trust. Don't rip me off and don't lie to me. Number one, don't lie. Which is a pretty low bar. I can't stand it. It is. Just don't lie. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'd rather you hurt my feelings and tell me the truth than lie to me. Because once I find out, then, you know, game over. So I went TV up, production, yeah, Chicago. We're getting there. So I went to the bar <laughs> and didn't want to meet anyone. I was drinking a gin and tonic and um, bitter, bitter. I just remember I was so angry. I'm like, why did I move back here? This sucks. And um, there he is. And people look up the word kismet, um, look up love at first sight, because believe me, that's exactly what happened. We looked into each other's eyes, and I knew. Exactly. I was just like, I couldn't breathe. I could not breathe. And this is your husband? Yeah. Wow. So you met him at this bar, and it's like, wha-bam. And he wasn't supposed to be there either. His boyfriend (laughs) at the time... They did collectible shows. They twirled all over the tri-state area selling Barbie dolls and Hot Wheels and collectible things. And his boyfriend at the time, I want to stand in the bar. So they went to the bar. And he didn't want to go. He, he bitched and moaned about it. But they went. And, well, there you go. What the heck? Yeah, well, <laughs> his boyfriend took him and met his husband. How ironic. <laughs> Live with that. Um <laughs> <laughs> that was hateful. I'm gay sorry, people. but yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> gay people. Gay We're people. so complicated. Yeah. Um, but that's exactly what it was. And it was like, it scared me, but I needed it. What scared you? Love. Mm. Because every time I gave that part of myself, I gave it to the wrong person. Um, and actually, I had one person in California give it to me, and I couldn't handle it. Mm-hmm. Um but, you know, things come when the teacher comes when the student's ready. Oof. And um, I was ready. I just didn't realize it. And um, I, I just I still remember that night. We, we walked out of the bar. His boyfriend at the time went off with some other guy, and they went twirling off. So me and him went for a walk, and there's this um, construction business there, and we hit it in the rocks. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And we come back to this bar. This bar is in Northwest Indiana. The fire station or something. I don't know what it was, but it was in Hobart. And I can remember my mother, leave it to you to find the only gay bar in Indiana. Okay, no. Yeah. Northwest Indiana, South Bend, Elkhart. Yeah. They got like 20 gay bars. Well, they do now. They didn't then. We don't Not have a single one in Ann Arbor. You go to Elkhart, Indiana. Whoo. Really? Yeah. That's anyways. Funny. What's up with that? <laughs> yeah. But we, we did our thing and we come back and the side of the door to the bar was open there, the dance floor. And I guess we looked like we had been busy. Mm-hmm. And I opened up the door and we come walking through and it was like the parting of the sea. And all these people just let us walk through and we go up to the bathroom to refresh. Uh-huh. And um, the rest is history. Wow. Yeah, that was that. He took me up to Mount Pleasant. We worked at the casino. Um, we got bored to death because on your days off, you know, you had to drive 100 miles to find something to do. Mm-hmm. So we came down to be blackjack dealers at the boats in Indiana, and that that worked for a while. It was boring. And then I went back to the medical field, and I got a job in a hospital in LaPorte. And this one weekend, I'm sitting there, 
And I'm reading the newspaper, and it said, "Wanted a 300 pound man for movie role." And I'm like, "Give me an ounce of weed in a few weeks, I'll be there." <laughs> and um, so I called up, and he goes, "Oh, okay. Are you Latino? No. Do you speak Spanish? No. Well, okay. Well, I told my husband about it. Well, he went to school for media production, and he called. He got a job as um, a production assistant." I can't remember the name of the movie. It had Tyne Daly in it. She's a hoot. Okay. Okay, a real hoot. And Broadway legend? Yep. And she actually had her boob right here. <laughs> no, so sorry. For I'm those standing listening, there. <laughs> I know. He is pointing to the, 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 the fold the, of my left arm. Yeah, his elbow pit, there if you was will. A, a, she had a Halloween party and she cooked pies, and we're all saying goodbye, and she walked up <laughs> next to me. And I had my arm out, and she's just right there, and I'm like, it's. I know people, it sounds weird. But it's something I'm excited about because her boob was on my arm. <laughs> and I couldn't move. And I wasn't going to move. She moved and then it was over. Yeah. But it was a moment. And um, that led to one thing. And then he made friends there. And they're like, oh, come up to Chicago. There's all kinds of jobs. And then we got a job on a show called An Appraisal Fair. Mm -hmm. And um, we're production assistants. He got me involved in it because he could make $175 in a day. And it, I made, you know comparatively in a hospital here i'm helping save lives and i'm making like 300 a week mm -hmm. so it's not happy sure and anyway he got me involved in it and then one of the guys we met up there goes oh there's this show starting over here called what about joan it's got joan cusack oh my gosh exactly so i ended up going there and got the job now people we got to rewind if we go back to hospital hell when i was there in the beginning there was a nurse that worked there that um, was very nice to me she's very kind um, she used to tell me how to, she helped me learn how to behave mm. so that they would stop picking on me. Mm. Well, she was what they called an extra. And, um, I go, what do you do? And she goes, oh, you just stand in the background and you don't have to act or nothing. Just just film you. You act like you're talking and blah, 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 blah. And I go, that sounds like fun. She goes, well, I'll see if, you know, I'll ask your doctor if you can go. Well, they said yes. But here's all these hoops you got to jump through. So I jumped through the hoops, and then they said no. And it was a movie called My Bodyguard with Joan Cusack. And okay. I'm like, oh, okay. So I didn't get to go, and at the time I was crushed. Mm -hmm. Well, this hospital was on Roosevelt Road. Guess where the studio was? On Roosevelt Road, about 10 miles east, a few miles east, about 20 years later. And what I was denied is a youth. <laughs> Here I am as an adult. Yes. So it was a full soccer moment, and my names are my name, my husband and my names were in the credits. So we're always in Hollywood celluloid. Indeed. And um, it was a very surreal experience when I'm sitting at the desk when I first started there as an office PA, mm -hmm. and I look up and there she is, Joan Cusack. Dun dun dun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, people. Warm fuzzy. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it was very surreal because when I was a kid, I wanted that so bad. Mm -hmm. So bad. Mm -hmm. And then, the, you know, it's like so many times in life, it's like, here's the golden ring. Do you see it? Is it close enough? Come on, touch it. Ah, oh, too bad. Yeah. And here, 20 years later, almost to the day, she's standing right in front of me, shakes my hand, and has no idea who I am. Yeah. None. Um, has no idea what a profound moment this is for me. Can't ex can't, couldn't explain it to her if I had trapped her in the hallway and tried to. Um, it was for me. It was a gift from the heavens. Mm. Um, just, I, I, it was so unbelievable. And the best thing I got out of that is she was, she's just a normal, she drove a Dodge Caravan for Christ's sake. <laughs> Okay, go to Celebrity Net Worth. She's worth millions. She drove a Dodge Caravan. You know, she wasn't, there was nothing pretentious, the most down-to-earth person. Um, I got to work with a lot of cool people there, Kelly Williams from Urkel, um, Kyle Chandler from Friday Nights or something, um, Donna Friday Murphy, Night Lights. Jeff Garland. I have his hat. <laughs> yeah, um, that was the second season. And I met that one that... Um, Dated Marilyn Manson. I can't remember her name. Rose McGowan. She was interesting. Uh -huh. Anyway, I met all these people. And I'm here to tell you people, if any of you are out there think, oh, if I'm a star, life will be wonderful. I'm here to tell you, no, it's not. 
The only difference between them and us is that they took a risk. Mm. Okay? If you think they get all those scenes on one take, no, 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 no. Got to do it again. I need a better reaction. Do it again. I remember this one time they're um, cueing Joan to do something, and they wanted her to get angry, so the director looked at her and goes, Arlington Road. Remember that movie? I'm not familiar with She was a psycho. (laughs) And she went from total goofy to... I'm ready to slit your throat in an instant. It was like, wow. Incredible. Um, The most fascinating thing I got out of the two seasons working there is that um, it's the people in the background. Mm -hmm. The construction people, you would not believe how these sets are made. How something looks on TV, when you look through the camera and then you go like that away from it, it looks so different. Um, The artistic aspect of it, the production of it, what really went into it. Fascinating. Fascinating. I could only imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, um, as far as actually being the actor, no thanks. At one time, that's all I wanted to be was anyone but me. Yeah. Um, huge fantasies in my mind. But it's, the rea- reality of it was, especially being there, was, no. Yeah. It's not easy. It's all kind of dawning on me um, just miles from where they had locked you up as a young person. You're now living this uh, on the fantasy same, life. On the same street. Yeah. Roosevelt Road. <laughs> yeah. Hospital Hell Studio. Hospital Hell Studio. Um, yeah, life's funny like that. It was so good for me because it started what I called the awakening. When I first met my husband, I couldn't be intimate in the light. When mm-hmm. he would tell me he loved me or I was sexy, my skin would crawl. Mm-hmm. Seriously. Now, ironically, it's all I ever wanted. I prayed for it, begged. And when I got it, I didn't know how to handle it. And he, and he looks at my husband looks at me one day and he goes, do you think I'm handsome? I'm like, you dropped that in the street, gorgeous. He goes, then why would I pick something that isn't? <laughs> There's so much. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I know, but for me, you know, it worked. He knows me better than I knew myself. But that's what that's what started the change. That was the awakening, realizing that you know, I don't need to be the super. I don't need to be the super person. I don't need to be the super homo or the super man or the super anything. Yes. I can just be me. And then when I realized that, I'm like, okay, well, who am I? Ooh. And if you think that's an easy question to answer, wrong. No. Um, it's not. Because then I had to figure out what, what's my favorite color. Because the guy I fell in love with in high school, his was purple. So mine was purple. You see what I mean? I do. I, the last guy I was with in California, I like new wave, punk rock, oingo boingo. So I did. Mm-hmm. I had no identity, so I took on theirs. Um, so then I had to figure out that um, Thomas likes classical. Mm-hmm. Jazz. Opera, disco, a big disco doll. Big. <laughs> <laughs> and I have no shame. I don't, I don't care. I, I would rather cha cha to Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy or whatever. <laughs> Susie Q Harmony. Wagon Wheel um, Watusi. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, it's, what, it's what makes my soul click. Mm-hmm. And that's what I started to realize. What is it that makes me happy? What do I like? I don't like spooky movies. They might have. But I have better things to do than watch someone get chopped up with an axe. I know it's fake, but I'm not into it. But I love a good suspense movie. Mm-hmm. Okay. That type of thing. In the, if this does not apply, don't be shy to say so. Mm. But I, it, it, some in my personal experience and the experience of some of people of my friends and family, when you don't know what love, real love looks like, you think that it's always it's supposed to hurt. It's supposed to be dramatic. It's supposed to be cuckoo crazy. Mm-hmm. And then when it, it, when it's real actual love, you go, what the fuck is that? Or it's so what calm. is that I meant to say? Well, see, you're right. You're right on the right level. Because it's like people don't understand when they see me and my husband interact, we have our moments. <laughs> okay. Oh, trust me. Honey. Yeah, I know. We, ha- we have moments. <laughs> um, but we jab with each other. We, I don't know how to explain it. We know each other. We know how far we can push each other. Mm-hmm. Um, then the other thing is, is people are like, you guys seem so mean to each other, especially they'll go, you're mean. I go, I'm not mean. Because when we're lovey-dovey in front of people, 
it makes them uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So we, we have this whole new facade that we put up just so that you'll shut up and be comfortable around this. Do you understand that? If I was to go up to him and show him the true love that we have for each other and the passion in front of his family, they would explode. Yeah. What's that? I was thinking of moving to Ferndale. I, I can show you the text. My mm -hmm. brother-in-law, why would you want to go to Ferndale? That's where all those queer gays live. Well. His favorite joke, hey, Thomas, you know the difference between a refrigerator and a gay guy? A refrigerator doesn't fart when you pull meat out of it. And they think that's okay. I hate that I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but... It's different context. You different have context. to understand the tone that they say it is. Yes, yes. Okay? It's not funny. It's not, because it's, it's not amongst friends. And it's condescending. Yeah. It's not and a funny joke between me and you. It's, a funny <coughs> it's not a funny joke. And I want to make you no, feel like it shit. Isn't. Yeah. It isn't funny when his mom tells me that I like to suck lollipops, and that's a polite word. And I know you people out there know what I'm saying. <laughs> um... But that's her turn for me. And I, why do you say that to me? Oh, I was in a bad mood. The clouds weren't right. <laughs> well, the, you, you said something that made my brain go, ah, this idea that there's, like, gay people who do it right and there's gay people who do it wrong. Mm -hmm. The way gay people do it in Ferndale is the wrong gross way. Yeah. They're too gay. What's too gay? Oh, those RuPaul drag queens. Uh, Not everyone's a drag queen. Yeah. And I looked at him one day and I go, you know what? Do you know who Bi Bianca Del Rio is? Yes. My favorite. <laughs> and Alaska, Alaska Thunder. Yes. All right. They're my two favorites. Look up their, their net worth. Mm -hmm. What do you do for a living? I look at them. How much do you have? You're three payments. You're one payment late to a foreclosure. <laughs> you do not the, need to drag these you people. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So well, it, you got it's them like, together real quick. <laughs> yeah. RuPaul's worth $70 million. Yeah. What are you worth? Mm. Oh, well, that, yeah, yeah. And they're like, get all the pens. I'm like, then shut your mouth. Yes. You know, and, and that's just one aspect of it. But don't, we can all take a joke. Because if you can take it in the backside, you better be able to take a joke. Ooh. Okay. That's and my I, tombstone. That's, I heard, that's not my line, that's a comedian. But it's the <laughs> truth. And I can take a joke. But if you're going to say it in a demeaning way, then you're going to get the middle fingers. I don't accept that. Especially from people that are supposed to be my family. Yes. And uh, when he told that joke to you, it wasn't a joke. You no, know, that him and my other brother-in-law sat there and pointed and laughed. Yes, they thought it was funny. And it's, it's that's uh, in this word I feel like is everyone's favorite word, but that's bullying. Yep. Um, and it's also uh, they're saying you're not like those uh, uh, Ferndale gays. What they're saying is you're not feminine. And what they really hate is femininity. Mm -hmm. And they hate it when boys are feminine. They hate well, it when the one who said the joke to me, if he wears his pants any tighter, Ooh. It, even the, guy, the guys in the union that he works with, they're like, what's, <laughs> my husband works with him. Okay? okay. And he comes home one day, he goes, you wouldn't believe what they said about him. I'm like, what? He goes, they asked me, why does he wear his pants so tight? <laughs> it looks like he has permanent camel toe. <laughs> <laughs> And he's the one who's been telling the refrigerator yeah. job. And he, it's like, it, sir, it's we like, can see your you moose knuckle and your Jesus pedal Christ. pushers. And it's not that impressive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jesus, give me a break. Um, I think Ferndale is a wonderful place to move. It's fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous Ferndale. That's my goal. Yeah. That's, and yeah, that's where I want to end up. My best friend lives in Ferndale, and it's uh, an incredible um, place I to I want to be, you know what I love about it? Is I can relax. Ah, do you understand? Yes. How important that is to me at my age. And there's affirmations. There's restaurants. There's the rusty something on the corner. Mm -hmm. All these shops and stuff. Um, I want to be around my people. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of being out in the suburbs with all the you know th the right wingers. Sure. Do I dare say that. Yeah, you're good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't need to make America great again because it's always been great. How's that? If that offends you, then get on the phone and call a psychiatrist. It's about a hundred dollars an hour, and have fun. <laughs> they ain't listening to this. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah. no, you never know that. Oh, maybe, yeah. You never know, because I see it on Instagram on the all the time. Yeah, it's, oh. they really go after Kathy Griffin. Oh yeah, they're after her with the damn ketchup and the. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, then you know she's talking about Trump or something, and I don't know. It. And when she, then she got cancer, and they're like, oh, I don't have time for this shit. What, aren't you dead yet? And they're saying it back to her. Yeah, it's, 
It's so high school. You know, I, I graduated, you know, a long time ago. I don't <laughs> want to deal with it. And if people really thought about it, Trump is a drag queen. He's got a full beat. He's it's got a full hair. face of makeup. Oh, someone needs to get him some different powder. Jesus yeah. Christ. <laughs> we got to do some color God. correction. Um, and he wears kind of big tunics and s- makes terrible jokes for a living. That's a drag queen if I ever heard of one. But they before we go down there. Yeah, let's not get into politics. Yeah. <laughs> let's That's run not, from yeah, run. politics, in fact. I want to talk about it. I'm um, not, put it to you this way. I'm not happy with the other side right now. Oof. How was that? I just got it in got in it with somebody yesterday about that, mm-hmm. but I can't. They're gonna. I know. Uh, we love America. Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we do. We do. I jokingly would, and not jokingly. Jokingly or not, I wouldn't live anywhere else. Sure, except maybe Canada. No. Nah, or close. Germany. <laughs> they're too broad. South of France. <laughs> no, they're too narrow. <laughs> Uh, Taipei? <laughs> I'm kidding. Maybe London. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> they, have, they had a queen. Yeah. I was oh. so mad when she died. Like, damn it. I liked her. I don't Me li- too. It wasn't just her. It was a jewelry. <laughs> I don't like the monarchy. I think that's all baloney. I know. But I like her. But it pisses me off when I see Camilla wearing her jewelry. It just I don't know why. It gives me gas. Would you <laughs> would you wear the other woman's jewelry? I wouldn't. Hell yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> if it was hers. Yeah. I just want to go play dress up. Yeah. And that's they do that over there. Oh, yes, in do. the in the Buckingham Palace. Yeah. Um Where now I'm all off track. Okay, I know. I, I have that habit. <laughs> what advice would you have for people who have come out on the other side of conversion therapy? If they're listening to this and they're in a struggling place. Wow, that's a tough one. Um, There is no easy way to survive it. I'm not going to lie to you, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, I went through this as a young teenager, and I'm in my 60s. And as you've, if you've listened, you would see that my talking about something that happened 45 plus years ago still gets me nuts. Mm -hmm. Emotional, because it hurt. Okay, and that kind of stuff doesn't go away. Um, I would recommend. Oh God, how, as much as we want to be loved and need to be loved, as cliche as it sounds, you need to figure out how to love yourself first. Mm. That's the mistake I made. I ran to people, places, and things to find the love that I needed. That was the hedonistic part of the the issues. Um, if I like Doritos, I, suddenly I'd have 10 bags. Um, you understand that, yes. what I'm saying here? Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I would say to my younger self. If I could sit him down, I'd say, take a break, learn to figure out who you are, understand that what you went through is not your fault, um, and take some time with yourself mm. and figure out what it is that you like and realize that God willing, you live long enough to get to be my age, you're going to realize that you were okay the whole journey. Um, Take your time. um, Being okay with yourself is very significant um, because it's what gets you up in the morning. Mm. It's what makes you go to bed and get a good night's sleep, which when you get to be my age, there's certain things that you enjoy. Waking up in the morning, having a good bowel movement, a cup of coffee, and nothing hurting. Because I wake up now and it's like, what did I do to my knee? I have no idea. (laughs) Um, Be careful how you choose your friends and figure out why you're choosing them. Um, I chose people that made me feel good because they said I had a nice ass. Sure. I uh, was good sex. Um, what have you? had a party. All the things that are not important. Um, find the person that you can call in the middle of the night and say, look, can I talk? And they're like, sure. Mm-hmm. And that make you feel stupid. Oh. And then avoid the people that call you all the time with their list of 15 problems. And when you want to talk about yourself, they got to go. You understand? Yes. That's the narcissist. Um, 
Yeah. Just realize that, that you're, and I'm not saying this to discourage anybody, but you're never, ever going to get over it. Ever. You learn to live with it. And for me, it was realizing 40 plus years later that that thing I just said, it's not my fault. <sighs> yes. When you can say that to yourself and believe it, Ooh. you're on the right path. Because that's what helped save me. Mm-hmm. And that's why... I, um, that movie Goodwill Hunting with Robin and Matt when they're in the office, and he says that to him. I lost it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Lost it. Um, because see, as a gay person, as whatever letter you are, wh- however you identify, I respect. I'm happy for you. Have a good life. Yeah. Um, find someone that respects you, that treats you well. And the first person that needs to respect you and treat you well is the one you stare at in the mirror when you brush your teeth. We would like to give a special thanks to Thomas for being our guest this episode. If you've enjoyed this podcast, see what other podcasts Ann Arbor District Library has on our website, aadl.org slash podcasts and if you or somebody you know would like to be a guest on the gayest generation you can email me at the gayest generation at aadl.org